Okay, we'll call the meeting to order. Thank you, Your Worship. Okay. Uh, our first item this evening is a presentation. I'd like to invite uh, Mr. Jerry Townsend to come forward. He's here on behalf of the New Westminster and District Labor Council, and he's here to speak on the day of mourning for workers killed and injured on the job. So good to see you, Mr. Townsend. Thank you. Good evening. Each year, the New Westminster and District Labor Council presents to municipal councils within our region to ask for their support and recognition of April 28th as a day of mourning for workers killed and injured on the job. We thank the Mayor and Council for acknowledging this important day by issuing a proclamation declaring April 28th as a day of mourning and for allowing time for our presentation. Firstly, I'd like to extend an invitation. On Sunday, April the 28th, please join the BC Federation of Labour and the two lower mainland labour councils at 10.30 at Gary Point Park in Steveston to commemorate the 28th anniversary day of the day of mourning for workers killed and injured. Our presentation is designed to educate local governments and citizens on workplace health and safety issues. Workplace health and safety requires individual and collective responsibility and action to ensure that every worker is afforded a safe and healthy workplace. You may ask, what is the role of the municipal government in addressing these issues? First, it's important to remember that throughout our history, the labor movement and local governments have been instrumental in making changes for the better. Together, we have lobbied our federal and provincial government to adopt social programs like the unemployment insurance system, social assistance, and many other benefits we enjoy today. Local governments recognize that they are in fact the closest and most accessible to the citizens and citizen organizations like the Labor Council. It is this access that provides a critical link to our democratic institutions and it is this relationship that encourages us to speak before you each year to share information of mutual interest and importance. You may ask, what are we doing in our labor organizations to educate workers on worker health and safety? Since 2001, the BC Federation of Labor has operated the BC Fed Health and Safety Center. It is established to help train workers and workplace representatives so they could act with confidence and competence on their considerable legal rights and responsibilities as provided by the occupational health and safety laws. The BC Fed Center is funded by WCB and it evolved into a center of excellence for occupational health and safety training in British Columbia. The center's programs are open to all working people, not only for unionized workers. We want to talk about a few of the more critical health and safety issues that affect a significant segment of today's workforce. Late night retail workers in every community are exposed to violence and dangerous working conditions every single day. Knowing this fact, would any parent willingly put their child at risk for a job in the late night retail? Did the parents of young Grant to Patty think that their son would die working that evening at a gas station in the rural area of Maple Ridge? Or that his life would be lost while he was attempting to save his employer $12.30? The BC Federation of Labour conducted an extensive survey of late night retail workers. The comprehensive research document proved without a doubt there is a high level of violence and a prevalence of young workers employed in late night retail stores. The result was the WCB regulatory provisions for working alone with measures that would ensure greater safety and protection for late night retail workers. It was support from municipal governments like yours whose voice helped advance the working regulations. You knew the, this issue was critical to the citizens in your community. We have called on the provincial government and regulators to stop trading worker safety for expediency and profit. Tragedies of death, disease and injury go unabated in BC. 181 British Columbian citizens did not come home from work last year. They are our neighbors, a mother or father, a son or daughter, and most importantly, a loved family member. They went to work to put food on the table, and they had hopes and dreams. Are we motivated to change, to believe there was a better chance for 181 citizens? We say, yes, we are motivated, and yes, we believe something could have changed the course for the almost 200 citizens who die each year while giving their labor. We'll let you be the judge. In a recent case before the board, an employer was fined because they ignored the regulatory provisions, including safety instructions, training, and supervision. A worker died as a result, and the employer was fined $3,250. If not for the labor movement and others, who would stand up for working people and their families? Who would help workers and their families when they are devastated and their lives are shattered? 
We need to stop the drive to the bottom where less is more for some, while less is devastating thousands of lives. In closing, we thank the Mayor and Council and your, for your continued support. The New Westminster and District Labour Council appreciate your leadership and your willingness to engage on these important issues. On April 28th, each year, we remember the workers who do not come home, and together we share their families' griefs. And on April 28th, we recommit ourselves to fight for the living. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jerry. Um, actually, Councillor Sakura. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, the young gentleman that lost his life in Maple Ridge, there was a change done to where there had to be two employees at the same time after midnight, didn't it? Yes. Okay, now what happened? I hear that there's only one now. Yes, they've, they've uh, rolled it back and they've... Uh, Who did? They, the, the, the BC government, or through the WCB, have rolled it back and uh, by uh, using security cameras and uh, a panic button, they feel that that's, so that's all that is appropriate. And, uh, and it's not. And the, it's, it's tragic because uh, the grants law was passed to try to, to, try to uh, bring, bring um, was, was some semblance. Yeah. Sorry? Was the change uh, publicized widely that they were going to eliminate it back down to one and security cameras? It, it's been in the it's been in the newspapers and uh, the New Westminster Labor Council and, and labor organizations are lobbying to get a change, and uh, it's our hope that uh, the new government of the day will see fit to uh, to uh, uh, change those rules. There was no public meetings. No public meetings. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And Councillor O'Neill. Yes, thank you for the presentation. Very moving. Um, are, are we, is Canada generally, or British Columbia specifically, uh, moving in the right direction on the numbers of um, workers killed and injured on the job? Are we seeing, um, uh, let's say, 100 years ago, or 50 years ago, 20 years ago? We, uh, I presume we've got great improvements over 100 years ago. Uh, we, what, what, we, what, we have, and, and we have, but we, we have and we have not. Uh, what's happened, and I do have some other notes, we've just indulged me. Yes, what's happening is uh, I had to I had to strip down part of my speech because oh. of, I was limited to the five minutes. But uh, that is an important question. Um, the legacy of the past decade of workers' health, safety, and compensation in this province is shameful, in our opinion. The regulatory environment has been eroded more and more. Business now regulates. Employer premiums have been re reduced to a 30-year low. That in itself uh, speaks for itself. Um, there have been significant changes in some areas, um, but in other areas are not. For example, the asbestos uh, was, uh, has, has uh, been eliminated now, and there are steps in there, but at one time, workers worked uh, without masks, without anything. Uh, asbestos is a dangerous and toxic substance, um, and uh, uh, there was at least 300 asbestos-related uh, deaths every year for five years and it's expected to reach its peak by 2018. So we're still, uh, we're still going through that aftermath from the, even though we now forbid it and we have all kinds of stringent regulations on it, it's still having its impact. So, um, uh, so I can understand how uh, that would have a long-term impact. The regulations have changed, the workers aren't uh, exposed to that. Um, in terms of general workplace injuries and, gen and work workers killed on the job, um, have have we seen an improvement, a leveling off in those statistics? Yes, the, it, per per person hour. Per yeah, it's come down. Day. It it's has come, come down. It's, it's come down uh, considerably from from uh, ten years ago, but there's still significance. I, I don't have the stats. Okay. I'm sorry, but okay, because uh, you you had the information about lack of regulation, or you were saying that the poor regulation, yeah. leaving the impression it was more dangerous out there. But those statistics are improving and have improved in the last 10 years. In some areas, in some areas not. Like, for example, the one that we just talked about with, uh, with, with, the, uh, uh, with, the, with the grants, uh, 
grants law with the um, people that are at the gas stations, that hasn't changed. One that's, uh, one that's now happened is uh, we're now seeing uh, the, uh, the BC government is, has uh, chosen to um, uh, extend this to the liquor store, the private liquor stores, um, saying that simply a security button in the, in the video camera is good enough. Um, where and that's that's an erosion in our opinion. That's erosion of uh, worker uh, yeah. health and well, safety. Our, and our, 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 my council colleague here talks often about the outcomes, and um, right. so I was interested in what the outcomes of all the various regulatory changes have been. Um, and you said a little earlier that things have improved quite a bit in terms of injuries, and, and that's great news. Yeah. And the people yeah. dying on the job. And if we get that down to zero, uh, that'd be perfect. But it's great to see that it's moving in the right direction. Thank you. Thanks. Yes. And on behalf of Council, thank you very much for coming to present to us. Every year we, we um, welcome a representative of the New Westminster and District Labor Council to discuss this issue, to raise awareness of this issue. My grandfather died as a result of a workplace injury. Um, uh, crushed between two train, two cars oh. of, uh, on a uh, train, and back then injuries were all too f common. Today mm -hmm. they're still too common, and we've got a lot of work to do to continue to make it safer. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you, oh, Councillor Nicholson. Added himself. Thank you, Your Worship. Yep. Thank you. In past years, there's been a flag raising on our plaza toward the end of this particular week, uh, mm -hmm. and is that scheduled? I don't know. Uh, thank you. Through the chair, it's, it's my understanding we are going to be uh, doing that, uh, and uh, HR will be following up with a note to council. So we'll get a note, and we'll have the opportunity to be there. Thank yes. you very much. And council has uh, historically designated a plaque on the second floor of uh, City Hall here in recognition of those who've lost their lives uh, as a result of workplace injuries and occupational disease. Good. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mr. Gilbert. Actually, before we do that, um, I actually want to acknowledge some of our own workers. Um, on Saturday night, uh, we had a, a, an enormous um, uh, issue related to our, our sewage system. Uh, we had a major break on a 14-inch uh, force main. These are uh, somewhat significant failures, and uh, our crews came out at midnight uh, that night. Um, this is uh, by 8 o'clock the next that evening where they were still working. Some of those have been working um, almost nonstop uh, w on this. You can see the, the hoarding that's in place, the guards that are in place to protect from uh, uh, slope failure. These are ensuring that uh, somewhat innovative uh, 20 years ago, their standard practice today because we uh, the number of people that have been uh, crushed because of accidents related to this kind of deep digging, particularly where a pipe has failed. Um, our crew w did great work. They, um, this actually shows at least one of the vacuum trucks and Coquitlam's own vacuum truck. And the next photo shows the amount of uh, vacuum trucks that were involved in this. There were dozens of them sh because they had to pick up the product here and deliver it on the other side of the break. Uh, they ran all night and all day uh, trying to make sure that people at the Westwood Plateau could continue to flush. And so on behalf of Council, thank you to our crew, uh, and I wish, I hope Mr. Suzak will pass on our thanks for uh, an incredibly uh, a great response to a, a, a catastrophe. Uh, we ended up with some sewage in, in, a, in a creek nearby. We're working on making sure we mitigate the, any risk associated with that, but at the end of the day, um, the problem got fixed uh, thanks to the skill of a great response. Mr. Clerk. Thank you, Your Worship. Next item, item two, is the minutes of the parcel tax review panel meeting held Wednesday, April 3rd. Recommendation to approve. So moved. Second. Moved by Councillor O'Neill, second by Councillor Robinson. All in favor? Opposed? Carried unanimously. Item three is the minutes of the regular council meeting held Monday, April 8th. Recommendation is to approve. Second. Moved by Councillor Asmussen, second by Councillor Robinson. All in favor? Opposed? Carried unanimously. Item four is the minutes of the Multiculturalism Advisory Committee meeting held Wednesday, March 20th. Recommendation to receive. Moved by Councillor Reamer, second by Councillor Asmundson. All in favor, opposed, carried unanimously. Oh, 
we, we, that's right. Okay. We actually had a discussion earlier. We we're going to move to item number eight uh, because there are some audience members here present uh, that uh, perhaps wanted us to, to contemplate that one. This is the um, uh, item related to the BC Senior Games. Thank you. Wait, we'll wait till the recommendation is read. Sure. <laughs> There's a lot of enthusiasm. Yeah. Uh, perhaps just prior to reading uh, the recommendation, uh, this, is, this item does concern the BC Senior Games and the City of Coquitlam's 2016 bid preparation. Uh, Ms. Fordyce from our Parks and Recreation uh, and Cultural Services uh, area wanted to provide a few introductory comments. Ms. Fordis. Good evening and uh, thank you for uh, having us here today. In front of you um, is a report with four specific recommendations with respect to the seniors games and I'll answer questions you have after but I wanted to say a few introductory words um, before we get there and specifically about the uh, support from Dogwood, Glen Pine, Douglas College, Chamber of Commerce, um, the specific sport groups that are um, involved in this such as curling and lawn bowling and slow pitch as well as the sport advisory groups, the sports center user group, the sport council. We didn't get to the uh, field sport users because it was, uh, they had a very busy agenda. But um, the support has been amazing and in the council uh, chambers tonight we have three members from Glen Pine I'd like to recognize. Ms. Maxine Wilson, Mr. Tony Bragg and Mr. Bill Ray. Um, and they are here uh, tonight in support of it. I would also like to take a moment and uh, uh, apologize to Ms. Wilson because it does appear I missed on an email of March 17th her request to um, where she asked staff to have the sport directors and involved in any presentation and the board members that we may have. So I'd like to take this opportunity and just apologize. Sorry, Maxie. And uh, I will be available for any questions you may have uh, with respect to the report in front of you. Thank you very much. And uh, certainly thank you to those members who've come out in public and former Mayor Maxine Wilson uh, and colleagues. Um, Council has uh, given a lot of enthusiastic support to this uh, uh, initiative and uh, perhaps we'll get uh, uh, the clerk to read the item. Thank you, Your Worship. The four-part recommendation is that Council direct staff to prepare and submit a bid to host the 2016 Senior Games to be held August 23rd to 26, 2016. The staff be directed to form a community working group to assess in the development of the bid, that funding in the amount of $60,000 from the 2012 surplus and $55,000 of in-kind services and civic support um, uh, be used to support the Senior Games bid should the bid be successful and for that allocate any remaining legacy funding from the 2016 BC Senior Games to support and enhance activities or facilities for older adults in the community. Second. Second. Moved by Councillor Asmussen, second by Councillor Nicholson. Councillor Robbins. Thank you. Well, I'm very excited to see this come forward and it's great to have uh, some folks from uh, our local Glen Pine and Dogwood here to uh, to demonstrate their support. I do actually just want to uh, check in with staff on two things. One, um, and the purpose of the report talks about strategic goals, um, about to support um, corporate strategic goal of increasing active participation and enhancing economic opportunity. And I want to add that it actually strengthens, um, strengthens neighborhoods. It builds our capacity when you bring all these volunteers together. And we're seeing it right here in this room. So I think it's really important that we recognize that and that that's really one of the outcomes that certainly I'm going to be paying attention to, that uh, we strengthen our capacity uh, among our, our volunteer, um, that we already have a, a great group, but I think it, it, it will bring that up more. And the last thing um, I just wanted to comment on was that if there are, are any hiccups along the way, that you bring it directly to, to council so that we can, uh, because we're a resource too, and I think sometimes we forget. Um, I mean, we, we do a lot here, but I think there's sometimes when things aren't going exactly the way we want, that, um, that we have contacts and capacities and talents that uh, I think can be helpful to move these things forward. I'd really like to see it, uh, see it happen, and uh, let's use all the resources that we have to, to bring this to fruition. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Robinson. Councillor Asmussen. Well, thank you very much. I'm, I'm glad to see this is before us as to support this bid for the BC Senior Games 216 bid. We were just not recent, just not long ago, we had the 
medals from the participants in the BC Senior Games coming here before Council showing us their medals and be able to have them here in their own city proudly competing and winning those medals again in all those areas that they're good in and myself except for three councillors are all qualify as seniors that could participate in the games the only ones would be Mayor Stewart Councillor Robinson and Councillor Reamer. The rest of us could all partake in the games, but we may weigh you down for your opportunity to win medals, so we will step back from that. But good luck, and I hope we're successful. When Councillor Robinson asked for us to be considered resources, he didn't mean asked to be considered athletes. She didn't, she didn't mean athletes. She didn't mean athletes. <laughs> Councilor, speaking of athlete, Councillor Sikora. Thank you very much. We had the senior games here in 1991. They were very, very successful. And matter of fact, we had the summer games at the same time, the same year. And there was no problem with getting volunteers. Uh, at that time, the Dogwood Pavilion was 100% involved and did a tremendous job for us, so uh, I, I certainly support it. Outstanding. Councillor O'Neill. Yes, I, I support it as well, and uh, although it's uh, stated in the details of the report we're considering tonight, it hasn't been voiced out loud um, yet, um, I don't it's think. It's about to be, though. <laughs> but it's about to be, and the fact is that uh, 2016 uh, coincides with our 125th anniversary. Oh, yeah. and, um, the city of Coquitlam's 125th anniversary. So it would be a wonderful um, uh, legacy, a wonderful uh, jewel in the crown of events that we are going to be hopefully staging throughout 2016 to celebrate our 125th anniversary. So I'm fully supportive of this bid going ahead. Thank you. Outstanding. Councillor Nicholson. Thank you, Your Worship. And obviously I seconded it, I support it. Uh, Councillor Asmundson apparently knows how old we all are. I didn't think that was in our financial disclosure documents. <laughs> but I can tell you from my own experience in 1991, when Councillor Sikor was the mayor and I was the treasurer of the BC Seniors Games, you don't have to be a senior to be a volunteer. So let's encourage everybody, particularly the folks at home, to okay. get up and get out and volunteer. Thank you. Indeed, this, one, this will come together because of the spirit of this community and the spirit of folks like uh, when Maxine wrote in her email, uh, we'd be ex uh, uh, excited about being involved in a Coquitlam hosted games. I think that applies to so many people in Coquitlam. They would love to see us do this. And so with great enthusiasm, we dispatch staff to go get us the games. Thank you. So the motion is the games. All in favor? Opposed? That motion carries unanimously. Thank you. Next item on the agenda uh, is a return to item five, and this is the fourth and final reading of the Austin Heights Business Improvement Area Bylaw number 4394. The recommendations that Council give fourth and final reading to Austin Heights Business Improvement Area Bylaw number 4394. Moved by Councillor Reamer, second by Councillor Sikora. All in favor? Opposed? Then that carries unanimously. Item six is consideration of fourth and final reading of zoning amendment bylaw number 4335, an authorization for the issuance of a development permit for the properties from 953 to 969 Charlotte Avenue for proposed 88 unit development. The two part recommendation before council is to give fourth and final reading to city of Coquitlam zoning amendment bylaw number 4335 and that the mayor and city clerk be authorized to execute the DP. Move. Moved by Councillor Nicholson, seconded by Councillor Reamer. Councillor Sikora. Thank you very much. So on the parking of this development. <clears throat> how many units and how many parking spaces are they having? What's the ratio? Hi, Your Worship. Um, Mr. Alloway. Uh, let's see if I have the details here. In, the, in this case, the, this site is not within a TDS area, so it actually it has 88 units, and it f fully meets all of the parking under the zoning bylaw. And in this case, it's the full amount. It's not the... Um, bylaw allowable reductions within a TDS area. Talking about it's, it's, it's the full five or no, one? it's actually 1.5 per two bedroom. 1.5. 1.5. 1.5. So per it's two bedroom than 1. unit. 1.35. Your worship, the 1.35 is lower. It's, it applies within the transit development oriented uh, areas. This one is outside of that, so it's the full amount. It's the full 1.5 per two bedroom unit. There are no parking variances on this project. Okay, and, and uh, tell me, do they have elevators in this uh, development? 
Uh, yes, there are. No okay, is the elevators going right down to the parking down below? Uh, yes, they are, Your Worship. Of course. Yep. Thank you very much. Okay. So there's no parking uh, variances on this, and the elevators go right down. Councillor O'Neill. Yes. Thank you. Um, we heard um, uh, public hearing stage. I, I re as I recall, uh, many residents talking about the traffic implications, and um, and I'm glad to see that uh, staff has uh, given us quite a full report on the uh, intersection improvement at Charlotte and Le Bleu, and um, and and they've studied all the possible ramifications, and they're confident that the plan that they have now uh, going forward uh, will work and uh, is needed as well, and uh, so. Um, that's uh, that's that's good news there. Um, it's, um, that's really the, the thing I wanted to sort of get on the record because I wanted to address the the concerns that were expressed um, public hearing, and I think the staff has answered them and answered all the questions. And I'm um, I've got no more questions on that issue myself. Thank you. Thank you, and Councillor Reed. Thank you. I want to speak about the um, traffic as well. So we've decided to open up Le Bleu and Charlin. Did we have a further traffic study after? Hi, yes, Your Worship. Um, there was a preliminary assessment done. Yeah, I know. And that. it was brought forward. And, and, and yes, I, mean, I have a copy of that study here. It's quite a quite a lengthy study uh, undertaken by Bunt and Associates. Um, uh, the city staff worked with the developer to refine the terms of reference um, and. The developer's um, engineer did indicate that there would be some benefits. Um, it did indicate that there wouldn't be an immediate uh, impact, but over time there will be an impact in this area as development grows and traffic movements grow, and that would result in uh, impact on uh, um, associated intersections both with uh, Le Bleu at Austin as well as um, Charlotte at Blue Mountain, and there'd be some left turn movements that would begin to back up into neighboring intersections. So um, as a result of that, the transportation uh, planning and uh, public works has indicated that that connection is favorable and it makes sense to open it up at this time. So did they take into consideration future development of um, the, the site right there in front of the fire hall, you know, the Yes, uh, part of the uh, this study actually incorporated both um, immediate development uh, generated by this development as well as additional development, but also surrounding background traffic and what would be added to that as a result of the Austin awesome Heights plan. Thank you very much. Thank you. No other questions? Motion is fourth and final. And a DP. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Carried unanimously. Item 7 is a preliminary report on an application for zoning amendment bylaw number 4377. This pertains to 761 Miller Avenue. Two part recommendation from staff is that council give first reading to save Coquitlam zoning amendment bylaw 4377 and that bylaw 4377 be referred to public hearing. Second. Moved by Councillor Reed, second by Councillor Reamer. Councillor Asmussen. Uh -oh, I'm going to move this on to the first reading uh, for a public hearing. State. And my question through to staff is. We have four units, six spaces. Now, when we were going around our housing tour and in North Vancouver, remember we were talking about widening out the lane by pushing the garage back in to give some parallel parking in the back there. Now, I went down that lane. It's really fenced straight all the way down. It's fairly narrow. So you're going to be closing off. There's a driveway off the front existing there. Now, I went by there, took a look at it. So all the traffic is going to be coming out of that narrow lane. Is there any looking at maybe pulling those garages forward to create more parking space at the back? And is that lane looking to be widened out? If we're going to be having more applications in this area to do this and traffic coming all off that back lane, if you have another car coming the other direction, it's going to be quite tight in there. Uh, Your Worship, um some excellent points. Um, we, on every project uh, uh, under the housing choices uh, uh, spectrum of projects that we get, we do look at this issue of parking. As you know, the current bylaw parking is met. Uh, we try to maximize that parking on site when possible. We try to ensure additional parking is provided, in particular where there's cul-de-sacs where limited on-street parking is, is, um, is not there. Um, this one does have on-street parking. The lane is a typical six-meter lane. We have tried to push the garages 
into the site. Um, there is uh, some limitations in terms of the separation between the garage and the units. Um, we, it is in, we typically we need a couple of extra meters between the lane uh, on either side of the lane uh, for lane widening. In other words, if you if you obtain an eight meter lane and then an additional separation between the building, the garage, and the lane, you can get some parallel stacking in front of those units or at least be able to get turning movements. So we do look at that. It, it is somewhat dependent on the lot. In this case, I think we've achieved some additional separation. I think there's instead of uh, three feet, I think there's 4.1 feet to the garage. We can look at further pushing those those garages into the site. Um, in this case, we, we do have the the difficulty in this typology is maximizing open space between the buildings and between the garages and the, and the units in the back. So it's always a fine balance, but I, I certainly it is a consideration on these projects. We have different develops, and what I'm also thinking about is the there is a variance already, but can you pull the buildings closer to the street to hold, bring it forward, have it closer onto the street by opening up that? Because we have different developments in the northeast area where your depth off the front is a lot closer to the street and Generally, your front yard isn't an active part of the yard. You brought those forward. You could keep a more of the yard in the back, but also pull the garages into it. I'm just looking at the community. If we transition to this with housing choices throughout that area, bringing units closer to the street, but also creating that parking and widening out that lane for better travel. Uh, very good point. Uh, in the northeast, the zones in the northeast do have a, a four-meter setback and is intended to achieve a, a streetscape which which actually creates a more active streetscape the housing choices because it's 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 supposed to be transitioning and trying to be sensitive to the RS1 which is the prevailing zone the single family zone in the southwest we've taken an approach under that zone that the setback is a little bit bigger so that it then begins to transition to the RS1 zoning in the area however in this particular case as, as uh, you've raised we actually are advocating one of the homes coming to six meters instead of 7.6 because we're trying to create some additional open space. We can actually look at an opportunity here because there is a variance to move uh, those buildings, the other building up as well to try and create some open space uh, or some space between the garage and the lane for turning movements, possibly uh, improve that. But we are always trying to maximize, you know, those elements, the setback to the front, the internal open space, the parking availability. Uh, we don't have any um, uh, trees that we that we can save on this property, so that is helping our, our flexibility yeah, as much as we've looked to, to, for trees. So there's always all those elements we look at. Um, the way it's presented before council, and it can certainly go forward, and we would look at the possibility um, of varying the other the other unit. For instance, there's certain, one of them is going to six. We may be able to push all of them forward slightly if uh, council sets that's in that I'd kind like of direction. We could, we could certainly advise the proponent that that issue has been raised and to possibly be, be looking at that issue. Because that's one of the dynamics when we were up and, and going through that and we saw that. I think we had one unit building up there which quite, it had nine parking spaces, remember off the back there, that you could park and it really had the four units and was quite uniquely done. So I just want you to take a look at that. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Councillor Reed. Thank you. Uh, again, now that I love seeing these come forward, so we're we're starting down the the rocky road here. But one of the developments that we had last year, I believe, in the same neighborhood, although I don't think the, this lot is as wide, was where they came in off one access off the street and then had parking on the interior, and then everyone had open space on the other side. I like that because it actually gets the parking off and away from the neighbors too. So um, hopefully when these um, developments are available to come in that, you know, may, I hope staff gives some sort of, sort of guidelines, maybe like Councillor Asmussen or, or the ones I'm saying in the middle. Um, I like that idea too. And maybe if I can just explain, um, we certainly have heard council, uh, we are actually doing a uh, we're looking ahead to a summary report on some of the projects we've done through our the council and some of the things that have been raised just to make sure we're targeting the right areas in the housing choices. There's been questions about parking, uh, about the size of units. So we're doing a bit of a summary report and we'll be coming back to council with that report um, just so we can get an idea of how this is working. I mean, we're very encouraged that the development community is taking up these projects because they're adding to our 
our, our stock, important stock for infill, and they're also paying for important frontage improvements, and they're building the infrastructure. So we know we're, tar we're hitting the right economic profile. That said, we, we're making sure that we're, we're not done, that parking is still an issue, design is still an issue, and when developers do come in, we are talking to them about maximizing parking. Uh, we, we know what the bylaw says. Whenever there's a bigger lot, we're looking for more parking. We're looking for, you know, without sacrificing the project, we're trying to make sure that we get as much in all these areas, and we will come back to council with a summary I, I report. I think if we mix it up, Raul, if we mix it up and we have some inside and some on the, the perimeters, no, no street will look like a parking lot, so to speak, because it, it will be different, and, and I think that's what's going to be important. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Councillor O'Neill. Yes, thank you. Um, I know we're, this is a first reading discussion about a zoning amendment by law, and I agree that this is, uh, I want to move this forward as, um, as, a, as a, something for us to, to, to look at and listen to the public opinion on this. I think it uh, does fit into sort of the direction that City Council is wanting. Um, and, and since the, but, but since I want to just talk about the, the broader issue here, Councillor Reed talked about it and uh, Raul has talked about it a bit and uh, Councillor Asmussen has. And it, it is on this housing choices and, and I thought this, this is a really good kind of overview issue. Uh, this particular issue, um, sorry, this particular proposal in front of us kind of looks at uh, kind of a, uh, what am I getting at? I'm getting at the parking issue and the land use, okay? So often we've had parking issues that stand in the way of, of, of developments like this. And looking back over the last several months when, when these, these sorts of developments and rezonings have run into trouble, um, it, it often comes down to Yes, they meet the bylaw requirements of 1.5 parking spaces per little house, but there's no on-street parking. And um, so that was actually my big uh, uh, question mark. And just starting to take the preliminary look at this, I wondered what the street was like for on-street parking um, as we move forward in discussion of this, because it clearly meets the 1.5. There's four units, and there's six proposed um, parking spots. So, like Councillor Asmussen, I drove uh, along the street uh, and uh, and the back lane as well, and um, very happy to see that, as uh, you've said, that that it's lots of on-street parking there. Have a lovely picture here showing how wide the street is and how many how much on-street parking there is. So, um, so this is. Um, uh, so it was a big question mark, and it's probably a question that will come up. Uh, as we consider this as we move it forward in the next several weeks, uh, as we consider the different stages of zoning, and, uh, um, and there's an answer. Okay, thank you. Thank you for letting me share that. <laughs> no, thank you for sharing it. Um, Mr. Kirk, so there's motion on the floor for first reading? Yes, there is. All in favor? Opposed? Carried unanimously. Moving forward to item nine, as item eight was previously disposed with. Um, item nine pertains to development cost charge amendments, the recommendations that council directs staff to bring forward an annual bylaw in conjunction with the city budget for each of the next four years in order to adjust the city's development cost charges by the Vancouver Consumer Price Index. Move we'll by Councillor Asmussen, second by Councillor Reamer. All in favor? Opposed? Very unanimous. Oops. You've <laughs> got to push the button earlier, mm -hmm. Councillor mm -hmm. Nicholson. Councillor Nicholson wishes to speak to the motion that's already we've just passed. Go ahead. Well, that's right, and I voted in favor of it as well. <laughs> I just wanted to offer the comment. I, I'm glad to see we have the flexibility to, to keep these things moving along so that we don't get sudden changes at the end. But, but I, I have to comment on the, the idea that we're adjusting these by the Consumer Price Index because we always make it very clear at budget time that our city budget doesn't follow. We don't buy that basket of goods, and neither do the home builders. Our costs have very little to do with the consumer price index. They seem to go up faster, in fact, but I'm glad that we have this opportunity anyway. Thank you. Indeed, that, that is a flexibility that's r relatively new. We used to have to redo the whole process, identify all the basket of goods, cost them all out, 
work it all out, divide it by the amount of development, and uh, end up with a number. This now we can actually just assume the goods went up a bit in price, um, and therefore uh, the DCCs went up a bit, and we can adjust them um, every three years or whatever we choose to do on a more comprehensive basis. Uh, but the VPI takes care of the little adjustments in the interim, so that's good. Any further discussion? I'll do the vote again because Councillor Nicholson may have been quite compelling. All in favor? Opposed? It still carries unanimously. <laughs> uh, item 10. Item 8, I think. <laughs> uh, we just did that. Go ahead. Item 10 uh, pertains to the extension of banking services. The recommendations that Council receive the report of the Manager of Financial Services entitled Extension of Banking Services for Information. Second. Moved by Councillor Reamer, seconded by Councillor Nicholson. I'm ready for the question. <laughs> All in favor? Opposed? That motion carries unanimously. Item 11 uh, is concerns the QNET 2013 Annual General Meeting. Recommendations at Council, as a QNET shareholder, approve the Coquitlam Optical Network Corporation 2012 Annual Report, including its audited financial statements, that Council appoint a QNET Board of Directors to serve until the next AGM, as per the nominations contained in the report, appoint a financial auditor of QNET for the fiscal year ending December 31st, 2013, as per the recommendation in the report, noting that all of these items fulfills the annual general meeting requirements of the company for 2013. Moved by Councillor Nicholson, second by Councillor Asmussen. Councillor Sikor. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, the Board of Directors, when you, uh, are you advertising the general uh, election of officers and the paper that anybody can run for a Board of Directors? Is this a one of those where the staff from the City Hall must serve as Board of Directors. Uh, Your Worship, according <coughs> to our Articles of Incorporation, uh, our board needs to be filled by staff uh, that serve the city. So the staff have to serve on it? Uh, they don't have to serve on it. It's, uh, it's a voluntary possession, uh, position, but all of our directors have to be staff members of the city. Do you advertise this in the paper that you're going to have a general annual meeting for, for uh, a company that's owned by the public of the of Coquitlam. It's not a public company, though. Uh, it's a company owned by the city of Coquitlam. That's correct. Uh, according to our Articles of Incorporation, uh, we need to notify the shareholders in advance of the annual general meeting. Uh, there's no requirement for us to notify the public beyond that. Where, where is it normally advertised? I didn't see it, so I'm wondering. Maybe it wasn't looking close enough. What paper was it in? It would be posted along with the uh, open council agenda for this this evening's meeting. Just on the council agenda, but it would not be published in the local paper that the, any any of the public want to come to run for shareholders of this company could do it. So well, they can't uh, run for shareholder. There's only one shareholder, and it's the city of Coquitlam. The city, no, but directors. Well, the directors are appointed by the shareholder. We appoint. So, yeah, we so have, in other yeah. words, in other words, it's a closed shop. Well, yeah. it's it's uh, it's yeah. it's one shareholder. If if you yeah, if you right. own a company, it would be a closed and, shop. And and the shareholder is the taxpayer, but yes. the taxpayer does not appoint the directors. Uh, obviously, it looks like the the council members appoint the directors. No, the taxpayers vote us in. And the taxpayers appoint the directors through us. We are their representative. Uh, and we and we appoint the directors for this company. We're the, we're is the, that what it is? We're the representative of the tax of the shareholder, yes. <laughs> Doesn't sound too kosher to me. But anyways, in any case, I noticed that seven years ago we started this company. The, the city loaned you uh, $5.1 million. Seven years later, you still owe the company $5.1 million. No, they, they didn't know the company. That that doesn't look like a, a very profitable business. That the taxpayers are somehow have some kind of company they invested in that is not too, too profitable. Uh, Your Worship, uh, the company started in 2008, which was five years ago, and according to our business plan, it was going to take us five years uh, in order to achieve a break in uh, break even status on our financials, and we're predicting a positive cash flow for 2013, which is pretty much in line with the original business plan. Yeah, in other words, that's your business plan. But what happens if the business plan doesn't work out? You know, there's always, you know, we all draw up business plans for certain reasons. 
like we present a budget, like we have a budget for the year. <coughs> sometimes it works out the way the budget is set, sometimes it doesn't. So, you know, I mean, uh, those are things that are concerning me. Uh, I, I voted against this, and I feel that this is a very, very bad disservice to the taxpayers to owe $5 million five years later, and there hasn't been a bite. We could have built maybe a tennis court. Maybe we could have built many other things in the city for that $5 million that the taxpayers could use, or a baseball diamond, or soccer fields, or whatever it may be. Okay, thank you. Uh, this is the annual uh, report uh, of a company that was established by the City of Coquitlam five years ago uh, on the annual report. Councillor O'Neill. Yes, thank you. Um, refer to page seven of the 12 pages of the QNET uh, annual report. And um, I just, uh, I, and then that graph reflects the, what we've just heard that, um, that I'm going to start being in surplus and paying back some of the loan, but the loan, uh, the loan it'll take uh, quite a few years for the loan to be paid off back to the city. It looks like, according to the graph, that'll take place sometime around 2030. Is that correct? Yes, according to our current uh, revenue forecast, yes. Okay, and, and, and that, then at that stage, uh, there'll be cash flow going um, where? And I ask the question because I, I don't know whether five years ago when, uh, when I wasn't on council and when this was put in place or maybe in a subsequent year, some plan has been made looking that far forward about where this, uh, where the money will go. Does it get reinvested into the company? Does it get paid back to the city, corporation of the city of Coquitlam as dividends? Is, uh, uh, is there, after all the loan is repaid, there's going to be positive cash flow of, of several hundred thousand dollars a year. Um, I just want to know, is there, has, is there any plan specifically in place now about where that money's going to go? Uh, Your Worship, no, we uh, haven't uh, developed a plan for how those dividends are going to be used yet. Yeah, I know it's a long way off, and uh, but I just wanted to make sure maybe there was a fund that somebody decided to set up to actually build more tennis courts and playing fields, like Councillor Sikor said, or something like that. So I, I don't know. So right now, that that's just we're hoping that money comes back, and uh, and then it'll be then it'll start paying dividends. It'll be great. Thank you. We can build well, I'd, I'd go a step further. I think it started. I think it started to pay dividends uh, a couple of years ago, as um, companies, as uh, institutions, the city itself benefits tremendously. Our entire phone system is run on fiber optic, run, in, run through this network. Uh, the school district is going to be starting to save money and have enormous throughput at, in their in their internet services. Now, this becomes a tremendous advantage for our students. Uh, yours and mine that, that attend a school here in, Co in Coquitlam because they'll be able to be in the digital age in so much in a much stronger and richer way than uh, otherwise would be because of that throughput because of the savings that come out of that as well um, the school district uh, you saw the headline that shows uh, some challenging financial times I, I think this particular relationship with QNET and and the ability to save money on that side of it as well as to provide a, an augmented service will benefit the school district but I also look at those companies that have now invested in uh, in Coquitlam because partly because of QNET because of that asset that unique uh, feature that Coquitlam has underneath our streets uh, fiber optic uh, cables that allow business to sign on for almost nothing. Um, I, when I first agreed to this uh, and supported the, the plan five years ago, I, I disagreed entirely with the, I, what the staff call their conservative forecasting, their conservative sales forecasting. I believe it will, will achieve uh, payback of the loan much, be, much before that, and I think we'll, we're starting to see that um, the, those kinds of issues. Um, we're starting to see people showing the interest that I, I felt that they would they would show uh, this will be a to me a competitive advantage for our economic development side, for the economic development that next that May uh, May has been working on for uh, so so long and and others in previous councils and so I uh, applaud uh, QNET I think we're going to do some great things here, uh, Councillor Asmussen. Well, thank you, Mayor Stewart. Just to pick up on what you've said, you know, I was here when we made the decision to start QNET. QNET was the company to take advantage of an asset that we had in our streets. 98% of the fiber optic cable was dark. The issue was 
to bring money into the city that we can use as other fundings to meet those needs of facility needs or other needs. That was a dividend for um, Councillor O'Neill, was it to come back as dividends to us to fund our operations with other ways, other money than the taxpayer. So we're looking at an asset. How can we maximize that asset? And the Mayor Stewart picked up on a couple of things. One, the maximization of this is not shown in this report, but it's attracting business to Coquitlam. This is being connected, giving an advantage to us and our business areas with lower cost internets, faster speeds, so we can then bring businesses to this community, improve our job numbers, and improve our tax revenue from those businesses. So there's a great benefit to this. The second part about this is what Mayor Stewart pointed out also again, is that our staff and ourselves did not want to oversell this. So we had a choice. Do we make rosy pictures or do we take the most conservative process going forward? And that's what we decided to do is take the most conservative sales forecast, business plan going forward so that we would be protecting and not over promising. But as I, I look at the graph, we we're in 2012, we thought it would be paid out by 2015. We're down to 2013. We're getting better cash flow than what we'd anticipated. We are moving up on those payments and this corporation will help the city of Coquitlam move forward in many ways and investments in many ways in our community than was not anticipated and I think that the return is greater than what we'll actually get in a dividend in the businesses that will locate here because of the increased services so I, I'm, I've been supporter of this from the beginning and I think we've been asked by the public many times to Step out of the box. Think of other ways of getting revenues to your city rather than taxes. I know Mr. O'Neill and different ones have said, let's stop always just looking at taxes. And this was our attempt at doing that. So I give staff credit and I, I hopefully we will continue this and I know we will do better than the 2030. Thank you. There you go. The motion is to accept the um, annual report, uh, Board of Directors and Financial Auditor. All in favor? Opposed? Carried unanimously. Thank you, Your Worship. That is the last formal item on this agenda. Second. Moved by Councillor Asmussen, second by Councillor Reed to adjourn. All in favor? Opposed? Carried. And that as well. This was a unanimous meeting. There were no dissenting votes through the whole meeting. And that may be a harbinger of the wonderful work that two of our members are potentially leaving. Uh, this is the last council meeting. I should have actually done this before the adjournment. This is the last council meeting uh, prior to a, a voluntary leave of absence for Councillor Reamer and Councillor Robinson, who are off running in the provincial election. Um, you could say, we hope we never see you again, or something like that. But uh, um, you'll be, you'll, we'll, be, we'll be seeing you. So um, we wish you well. And uh, Councillor uh, uh, O'Neill has taken a picture of their last uh, council meeting. Uh, <laughs> there you go. We wish you well. And um, may politics treat you fairly, uh, which it doesn't always. Yes. No, we'll, we want to keep that distance in between Councillor O'Neill and the rest of Council. <laughs> the two of you have been our buffer. <laughs> and now I'll call for the... Okay. Uh, I'll keep the, all the men in line while you're gone. Yes. Yes. Councillor Reed will represent her gender on Council, and she'll represent it well. Are there any questions on tonight's agenda? Not on the rest of that last bit, but on tonight's agenda. Any questions from the audience on tonight's agenda? Any questions at all? Seeing none, thank you all for coming.